Okay, I want to continue. Um, the, the heavy lifting theory is done, but I just want to kind of now elaborate on some of the details. Remember I, I said that every consciousness has its own unique data stream, okay? And that data stream has to be interpreted by each individual. So you get the data and you have to interpret it. All right, now that doesn't seem to be too hard you know, to get because we have problems communicating with people because we don't, you know, if, if I speak to you, I use words, symbols, and metaphors that mean something to me that are part of my experience. You receive them and you have to ter interpret them in terms of your experience in some way that it means something to you. So you can see there's a lot of room for miscommunication there. That's why the men are from Mars and the ladies are from Venus because each interprets what they get, the data they get, interprets it in terms of their own reality, in terms of their own experience, and often that's not the same. Well, think of it in even a, a, a more drastic sense, is that your, your own experience that you have had defines how you interpret the data and what data you can interpret. If you get data, if you get information, and it's just so foreign and so different from the way your experience has been, you just can't interpret it. You don't know what to do with it. It's like data, but you don't have the metaphor for it. You don't have the symbols to express it. You don't have the experience. You can't integrate it into yourself. This is some of the problems we have when we explore the larger consciousness system. We get information and it's not like in this virtual reality. And we have a very hard time taking that information and putting it into something that makes sense to us. Metaphors and symbols that make sense to us. So that's an inherent difficulty in not only understanding each other, there's a difficulty there because we don't come from the same experience, but it's, an, it's a, a barrier when you get outside of this virtual reality, now you're getting data that's not like any data you've experienced and you have to you have to make a metaphor of it. What does it mean to you? You see? And most of us will have very different metaphors and very different things that we, we um, explain. So when you listen to somebody who's telling you about the things they saw and the places they went in a larger reality frame, you have to realize that you're just getting their interpretation of the data they got and not to take the specifics of it too seriously. Think of it all as metaphors. This is what it meant to them and learn to read between the lines as to what's, the really, what's really going on here, not the details. It doesn't matter that the, you know, that the people all had three heads. That's just like physical detail, it doesn't matter. What was it about the relationship that is significant? So you have to pull the significance out and not take too seriously the, the, uh, you know, the lines themselves. You have to read between the lines. The good news is that the more you experience, the more experience you have in these reality frames, the better you will be able to interpret the data you get. And the more accurately you'll be able to interpret the data you get. So it's like anything else, you have to work at it a fairly long time before you really get to understand it. Now, if we went to a culture that was very different than ours, if we went to some, I don't know, maybe the Aborigines in Australia, you know, and we just dropped in there and lived with them for a while, or maybe we went to China or someplace where they have a different culture, at first we wouldn't understand anything. We wouldn't understand the language, we wouldn't understand the customs, we wouldn't know what the food was, everything would be different. But if we lived there for a year, we'd start to be able to do all of those things. And if we lived there for 10 years, it'd be old, we'd be old hands at it, we'd be good at it, we'd understand all of it. It's the same with, 
with uh, your experiences outside of this reality frame. I mentioned consciousness and free will, and that consciousness and free will are necessary for each other. Both are logical necessities for the other. You cannot have free will if you don't have consciousness. I mean, what's a free choice mean if there's no chooser? And you cannot have consciousness without free will. What is there to be aware of if there's no interaction, if there's no choice? You see? So free will and consciousness know together. So if we at least agree that we're conscious, then we have to have free will. What is free will? Free will is the ability to choose among the choices that you have in your, um, in your decision space. I call decision space that those decisions that you have that you can make. So let's say in any, right now, in any situation, you have a certain number of decisions you can make. And there's probably more that you could make that you don't know about. There's whole concepts and thoughts and attitudes and approaches that maybe it's just, you just don't know. You don't have enough experience to realize that there are these other choices. So your choices are just, say, 10. There's just these 10 choices. Really, you might have 30 choices, but you only know of 10 that you can make. You have freedom, the free will, to choose one of those 10, what it is you do. How do you react? How do you be? You know, what, how do you interpret the data? You have free will to choose just among those things that are in your known decision space. That's all free will is. Now, people often get very confused about free will, and they think free will must be the freedom to do anything that you want. It's free will. You know, if you have the will that you want it, then it ought to happen, and if it doesn't, you don't have free will. That's not free will. That is illogical. Okay. You uh, only have the freedom to decide amongst those choices that you're aware of in your decision space. And that's all the free will you need. That's enough to let you choose A instead of B. Which one of those will take you closer to the growth that you need? Take you closer to lowering your entropy to becoming love? Okay, so that's the, that's the definition of free will. What that means is that the choices that you make are what drives your evolution. Okay, so you make a choice with your free will and the quality of that choice, is it about other or is it about self? Is it, you know, is it love driven or is it fear driven? That choice then means that you will either evolve or de-evolve. You'll grow up or you'll become less, you see? So that gets us to a, to a um, kind of a, a easy definition or an easy description of what we're doing here. So here we are in this virtual reality and stuff happens. We interact and we get to choose how we deal with the stuff that happens. And that's really all life is. That's a very simple description of what's going on. Stuff happens and we get to deal with it. And how we deal with it, the quality with which we deal with it, determines whether we evolve or not. So now that sounds very simple, doesn't it? What happens is that most of us spend our time focusing on the stuff happens, the front end of this problem, okay? So we, we take all of our effort and all of our energy to try to make sure the stuff that happens is the stuff we'd like to happen. We try to manipulate it, we try to control it, we want to make it come out the way we want it, what's good for us. Okay, so that's how we approach life, is, is trying to manipulate and, and control the stuff that happens. We do everything with the idea that if I do this, then that'll work better for me. And we put very little thought into, how do I deal with it? We just deal with it, you know, we just do what we have to do. But mainly what we do is in, a, is in an effort to control and manipulate the stuff that happens. So you see, we're putting the emphasis on the wrong thing. We need, to, we need to plan, that's okay. We need to think ahead. 
And uh, you, know, you can't just get rid of your intellect. Your intellect's important, but you also need to just let the stuff that happens happen. You need to let go of the control of trying to make it be the way you want it. Make it happen the way you want it. See, that's the ego that says, you know, what's good for me? I want it to be the way I want it. Instead, deal with it as it comes. Just let it happen. And whatever happens, you deal with it in a way that is positive, in a way that's helpful, in a way that's, that, that helps you evolve. And if you do that, that's a very simple prescription on how to live your life. Don't worry about the what happens, except a little. You can plan a little, but just don't try to manipulate that. Deal with what you've got. Now, you've probably heard lots of other people say, you need to live in the moment, you know, you need to be in the now. And this really equates to the same thing. You see, when you're in the now, you're just dealing with what's there in front of you and you're dealing with it from the heart and with caring. You're not trying to manipulate what's about to happen next. And then you grow, you evolve from that. So that's really a, another way of saying uh, the same thing. Instead of putting so much of our effort on the front end, we need to put it in the middle. We need to, we need to put it in the stage two. Uh, a question that often comes up is, okay, we're doing this evolution uh, thing with the larger consciousness system. Isn't there some better way for the larger consciousness system to evolve besides having us, you know, down here in this virtual reality, uh, you know, suffering and groaning and trying to, you know, trying to figure out which ends up? Isn't there, you know, isn't there some other way? And the answer is no, there isn't. This system has evolved to be the way it is because that's what works. We're here because we are on a fast track, basically, for evolution by coming to this virtual reality. And there really is no better way. And people will say, well, if this larger consciousness system is so clever and, you know, is a being of love and all that, you know, why doesn't it just get rid of us and just, you know, spread itself about it? It's already there. What does it need us trying to struggle up for? Well, you miss, that misses the point. You can, you can decrease entropy. Let's say you write a very meaningful book that has a lot of meaningful content, and that decreases entropy because now people read your book and they understand and they get bigger pictures and that's good. So that book has helped decrease the entropy of the readers. Now, if you just take that book and duplicate it and duplicate it and duplicate it, so you haven't done anything else. You've just taken what you already know and spread it around. That doesn't create growth. Growth requires becoming something new that you aren't already. It, growing up is a creation process. That's why it has to be for the being level. You have to change. It's a creation process. So it's not just that you could take a, a lower entropy uh, being lower entropy solution and say, well, here's somebody that's really low entropy, you know, Susie there, she's, a, she's all giving, she's all love, she's, let's just duplicate Susie and we'll, we'll just populate the whole world full of low entropy Susies and that'll solve the problem. It doesn't solve any problem, it doesn't help any. You've just duplicated what's already there. Growing up, evolving means becoming more than what you were, you see. So the larger consciousness system can't just declare that it's at the end, and you know, that's as far as it goes. It's not just decreasing entropy, but it's changing the total entropy to something lower than before. And you can't do that through duplication. You can only do that through growth. So this is the optimal system. The next question I often get is, well, okay, you have this larger consciousness system, and we're all pieces of it. Where did it come from, and what's beyond it? Well, that's a good question because this larger consciousness system is not infinite. It's just a system. It's a real system. Infinite doesn't really exist in any form of reality. You can't have anything that's real that's infinite. Okay, infinite is a, 
basically a mathematical term. And in mathematics, we understand that we can never get to infinity. Infinity doesn't really exist. It's just something you can approach. You go toward, you get bigger. If you ever got to infinity, well, it really wouldn't be infinity because you always add something to that and it would be bigger and you can't get bigger than infinity. You see, infinity is just a, a um, what can we say, uh, an abstraction. It doesn't really exist. Real things have to be finite. Well, this larger conscious system is finite. If it's finite, that means it has boundaries. Well, what's outside the boundary? That gets us to a point of understanding that some things we just can't know. Now, I don't say don't know, but can't know. There are limitations to knowledge. When my son, when he was 17, he read these books, and the thing that really bothered him the most was not only did he not know everything, which of course when you're 17, that's a big surprise, but he couldn't know everything. And that was a big, oh no, I can't know everything. But you can't. I, I use a, in the books, I use a, a, a metaphor that says, imagine you know, a microbe, a, a, a germ, a bacteria that's in your stomach that's in your intestines. What can that microbe know of food, food production, rain, sunshine, seeds, plows, soil, all that? And if it knows about sunshine, that has to be nuclear fusion. You know, what can it know about all of that stuff? Refrigerators, delivery trucks, bakers, you know, refrigerators, all of those things conspire to produce the food that we give that bacteria. As far as the bacteria is concerned, the food that comes down through the esophagus is manna from heaven. It just appears, you see. That's how the bacteria sees it, and it does its job. It decomposes that food. It breaks it down into elements that the body can use. Well, we're sort of like that too. See, that bacterium can't know about these things. It's not just that he doesn't. It's not just an ignorant bacterium. It just can't know about rain and sunshine and things like that because that's not in its reality. We're like that too. We have our limitations. We're consciousness and we can only experience consciousness. We're not stuck in this virtual reality that we call our physical universe, but we are stuck in the larger consciousness system because as consciousness, we can't go outside of consciousness because you know, we can't go there. Doesn't mean anything to us. It's not defined. We only exist inside this larger consciousness system. So there's limitations on our knowledge. So it isn't that we just haven't figured it out yet, or, you know, we just haven't found out. It's that you can't go there. There are some limitations. You are a piece of a larger system. And if you're in a subset, like this virtual reality, you can get to the superset, like the larger conscious system, but as consciousness, you can't get outside of consciousness. See? So we just get to a point that we say, we don't know. We can't know. It's not, we're like the bacterium. We just can't, we can't experience sunshine and rain. We can't experience germination and fields of crops and refrigerators and it's just not in our ability to do that no matter how smart we are how clever we are we just can't do it so where did that first potential energy come from that i described that it evolved into the larger conscious system it's beyond our ability to go there so don't see that as a failure of knowledge it's just a fact of life that we can't go there so some things will remain a mystery are there other maybe larger consciousness systems, other places? Is this just one, you know, and there's a, maybe, maybe not. You know, we have this larger consciousness system and it's created a virtual reality, a virtual reality, and what do we do? We create virtual realities on our big computers, don't we? And one day when our computers are clever enough or actually big enough and fast enough, we will have conscious computers. And those conscious entities will also be part of this larger consciousness system, except we will be the creator of that consciousness system. 
So now is there somebody who's the creator of our larger conscious system? Maybe. It's not our failure of knowledge, it's just something that we can't know. There's a logical, there's a logical problem if you're part of a system with knowing what's outside of your system. If your system is a self-contained you know, system, knowing what's outside of it is a problem if you're a part of it. Okay. <clears throat> well, what about other uh, reality frames? Uh, is this virtual reality like it? Is this the only virtual reality? This larger consciousness system created this virtual reality and it's our fast track and here we are and we're chugging along, evolving and the whole system's evolving. Are we the only game? No. There are other virtual realities that are chugging along just like this one. See, that's the good thing about digital things. Once a digital system figures out, evolves something that works, it's trivial to duplicate it and make another instance of it and modify it a little and make it a little difference and maybe change the rules just a little so you get a different kind of thing and see what happens. And can you visit and can you go to these other virtual realities within the larger conscious system? Yes, they're open to you. You can explore those places. And we'll talk a little bit more later about how to do that. Again, it has to be your experience or it's not in your reality. So you can do that and you can do enough experimentation with it that you can convince yourself that what you are experiencing is indeed real. It's outside of you. You see, we have two sources for our data that we get that we have to interpret. One is data that comes from outside of us. Larger conscious system gives us data and we interpret it. But there's another source, and that's ourselves. We make it up. We have imaginations. We can make up data and it comes to us and we interpret it. Now the question is, how do you tell the difference between the data you make up and the data that comes from the outside? Well, that's a good question. A lot of people get stuck on that point. They worry over that and it can be done. You can make that determination and it's really not that difficult to do. It's not something you can do quickly. And as most people who try to um, experience this larger conscious system, their first and biggest problem is they try to make that discrimination immediately. Okay, they go out, they go into a, 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 a meditation state, they get into a point consciousness state, they say, hello, is anybody out there? And then they hear a reply. And as soon as they hear the reply, they said, huh? what was that? Was that me? Was I just making that up or did I really hear something? You see, so right away, the very first thing, they start analyzing it with their intellect. Destroys the whole thing, you see. You can determine whether that's outside you or inside you, but it takes time and it takes patience. And you need to just carry on that conversation until you can determine the value of it. Which then takes us to the next step. Well, before I leave that step, if you keep your explorations to something that you can check, there are evidential explorations. That's what the remote viewing does. Go to places that are here. See things that you can find out if what you saw was what was there. You know, have conversations, learn things, and then find out if what you learned is true. So there's lots and lots of ways that you can do that are evidential. After you've done that lots to where the the evidence has piled up in that you're getting this information, the information is correct and there's no normal way that you could have gotten it, then you begin to feel like maybe it's real, you know. I certainly did that. It took me quite a while at Bob and Rose before I got to the point that I felt at a deeper level that it was real. So you need to do that and convince yourself with that and I'd say you need to do that first. But after you do that, and you have that experience, you have that knowledge base, then it's time to explore in a larger reality. Because by then you will have learned what's real, what's you, and what's not you. Carry on those conversations with these other entities. You know, keep at it until you have enough data to determine, is it useful? Because is it useful is a much more fundamental question then 
is it real? You see, we really don't care a whole lot about the source that we're getting if the source is beneficial to us. If we can learn from it, if we can grow from it, if we can get this data and see the bigger picture, have a bigger understanding, grow toward love, if it's actually part of our solution, then we don't care really where it came from. Oh, I made this up, it's coming from my higher self or something. Well, that's all right. If it's useful information, use it. Or, you know, I, uh, you know if you think it's, that's just me, but it's really good information, well, don't throw it out because it's just you. In other words, the source begins to matter less as you look at the data and say, how useful is it? So if you go into a larger consciousness system, you meet entities, you have conversations, and those conversations lead nowhere. You don't get anything that's significant or important. You don't get any evidence that can convince you it's real. You don't get anything that really helps you grow up. Let it go. It doesn't matter what the source is. If it's not helping you, go elsewhere. Talk to someone else. Do something else. So let it, you know, you, you're, you have a much more valuable discriminator. Discriminator is how valuable is it to you and your growth. That's the important thing. So you, you, read, you read books like, um, you know, Carlos Castaneda wrote a series of books about Don Juan the Sorcerer. And then, of course, shortly after he died, there's lots of stories about, oh, he made it all up, you know, none of that was true, and et cetera, et cetera. And then you have this camp that says it was too, and that camp that says it was not, and, you know, they fight with each other. And all of that is unnecessary. It doesn't matter. If you read his books and you feel like you learn something and get something out of them, then those books are valuable to you. Now, you have to test that knowledge. Is this real knowledge? Is it really useful to you? Or is it you're just kidding yourself? You see this game of, of, of uh, trying to determine values of things? Well, the way you do this is through a process that I call open-minded skepticism. You should always be open-minded. Open-minded to the possibilities of almost everything and anything. And skeptical of everything. Absolutely skeptical of everything, but open to almost everything too, you see? And you can only do this if you don't have any preconceived notions, preconceived expectations, beliefs, those kinds of things get in the way. So that's the key. All of your investigation and all of your growth will be facilitated greatly if you use open-minded skepticism. Always be skeptical. Don't accept things that I tell you just because I tell you. Be skeptical, you have to be. Again, it's not your truth if it's not your experience. Okay, so that's the approach. So if you use open-minded skepticism and you hear that voice and you say hello and they say hello back and you go, what's that? Instead of making a judgment and doing analysis of is that me or is that something else, which you can't answer that question at that point, you don't have enough data. Just be open-minded and say, well, let's find out and start the conversation. But be skeptical at the same time and realize that, you know, six months into this conversation, I'm going to have to decide whether I'm actually learning and, and getting something from this or I'm not. If it's not useful, does it matter whether that's inside or outside of you or not? You know, it doesn't really. So see, that takes all the this thing that I've got to know, I've got to know if it's this or that, that's just your ego talking. That's your fear. You fear that you're tricking yourself. So you let the fear get in the way and block the experience. So you just have to be open. And we talk about meditation, we'll talk about communications, we'll talk about going to other reality systems. You know, these things are all kind of fun. This is the fun stuff, right? Instead of that theory that you know, made you listen to this morning. That's the fun stuff, but all of this stuff is only possible if you can be open-minded and skeptical. You have to be open-minded. You have to just let things happen. Let them run their course. Let what, let what happens, happens. Don't try to control the front end of it. 
let the front end of it be whatever it is and deal with it. All right. Um, so there's lots of places to go. There's lots of other individuated units of consciousness, except the ones that are in this virtual reality game. And well, let's talk a little bit about how, how you might communicate with the uh, larger consciousness system. There are several ways that you can communicate with this larger consciousness system. One of them is your intuition. One of them is pictures, you get images. Another one is metaphors and symbols. Okay, don't expect to get things that make sense to you here because this is not, you're not talking with a physical, you know, another virtual reality. So you'll get uh, symbols, metaphors. Um, you may directly get it into your intellect. If that turns, it's not as common, but some people do get a direct channel, if you like. They talk, you know, they have conversations. They, they give sentences, they get sentences back. More people, though, get metaphors and symbols back that they have to interpret. Um, when, you, when you get this, if the larger consciousness system, say, wants to communicate with you, and you're out there and you're just experimenting and you're doing it, and in order to help you, to help you along and encourage you, the larger conscious system may give you some information. And if they do, they'll probably give it to you in a way that is helpful to you. So if you have beliefs of some sort, if you have experiences of some sort, then they'll take that image. So you see, if you're Catholic, you may end up talking to St. Peter or Mary or Jesus or something like that, because that is something that connects with you and you can interpret that and it makes sense. You've got background there, okay? If not, you know, it may be some wise guru with a long white beard and a robe, you know? Now, why do wise gurus all have long white beards and robes in the larger conscious system? Well, that's our, we dress them up like that, see? That's our interpretation. Why do they even have bodies? They all look like humanoids, right? They all have heads and, you know, they talk and they have legs and arms and stuff. Why is that? That's our interpretation. Because with us, if we get a communication, we immediately interpret that as a being. And any being that we imagine or interpret is a being that looks sort of like us, because that's all we know. We only communicate with us. We don't communicate with dogs and cats and horses and rocks. So we get a communication, we turn it into a being that looks like us. And because it takes a lot of trouble to build a, phrase, a face with a freckle here and a, you know, a spot there and the color of the eyes, we generally just let that be kind of not too distinct or we put them in a robe with a hood where we really don't see all that detail. And that's because that detail doesn't matter. We also tend to want names. Oh, who are you? You know, what's your name? And of course, names are irrelevant. You know, it's not about names. People, you know, the entities you will meet in the larger conscious system, they will use a name. Often when you ask that, you'll get this silence and you think, well, maybe they don't want to tell me. But it's just the whole concept of a name that you're called something, that there's a sound that, that means you is just foreign. It's like, huh? A name. Oh, okay, I understand. Yeah, call me Fred. You know, call me this, call me that. And they'll make something up to make you feel better because you need a name. I mean, how else can you address them without a name? It's impolite to say, hey, you. You know, you need a name or you can't talk to them. Of course, in the larger consciousness system, you communicate with your mind. It's all telepathic. Now, sometimes that can get to the point that it sounds just like English, you know, and you're speaking English and you go, oh, it's great, these people I hear know English or Spanish or, you know, French or whatever your language is. Well, that's not the case. You're just taking what they're telling you, you're converting it into your language so that you can think about it. You see, you can't think about it without language. Language enables you to have thoughts that you can manipulate that you can say wow that was you know this and that and if you're going to do any kind of assessment or any kind of processing on it at all first thing you do is interpret it into language you take the metaphors and the symbols produce language 
and then that's what you tell somebody that you saw. Oh, I saw this guy and he was green, had you know, big pointy ears and you know, three heads. And you tell that to people, but you realize that's just you producing metaphors to give the best kind of sense of what you experienced. So don't be too surprised to experience things that are strange because in the beginning, you're thinking, wow, whatever's out there is going to be really strange. Well, you get some data and you'll interpret it as something that's really strange because you have an expectation. So you see, part of the problem is things like expectations. If you have expectations, you'll find them, you'll create them. If you have fears, you will create them. If you say, oh, I go out here and something's going to get me, you know, if there's other things live out here and I get out there, what if it's a big one with big teeth? And those fears, you will create the thing with big teeth because that's your fear. Okay, this is the nature of consciousness. And it's not a good idea for you to go exploring in these spaces if you're fearful because you will create, you'll, you'll, you'll give body, you'll give form to your fears and have to deal with them. That's true with meditation as well. And much of what you will experience in the beginning will have to do with fear until you let go of the fear entirely and then your experiences become more of what they really are. And you let go of the expectation, you let go of the belief, and now you're just open. Get data and you still realize that you're interpreting it in terms of your own past experience. It's still you that's doing the interpretation of the data. And then you practice and practice and, you know, work and work. And eventually your interpretations get less of you in them and more of just the interpretation. So it's just a little bit of the, of the uh, kind of the problems and the, and the things that we, we have to deal with. Let's see. Um, uh, here's one that will probably be a little confusing. And that is when you... You only, you only have free will. You only exist as, a, as an individuated unit of consciousness with free will when you are in an experiential virtual reality. I mean, what are choices if you're not in a virtual reality of some sort? A virtual reality means you can interact. So even the big chat room that we talked about was a virtual reality. Otherwise, if you're not basically, you know, playing a character in a virtual reality, there are all kinds of virtual realities. There's real button down ones like this one, real tight rule set so that everything has a tight causality. And then there's looser virtual realities like your dream reality. This is another reality frame when you're dreaming. And what's it for? We'll talk about that later, but it's basically for the same reason this one is a place to learn. You learn stuff in that reality. You go through the motions. Things happen to you. You have to react. Things frustrate you. You have to deal with it. You know, it's, it's another place that you can learn, but you can learn different things there and in a different way because it's not so buttoned down as this one. This one, everything has to be consistent and consecutive and whatever. There, you can hop and jump around and have different experiences, different times. You know, you can be eaten by monsters and, you know, you still wake up just fine. You can be eaten by another monster the next night and that's all right. That doesn't happen here. You get eaten by a monster and here, you know, you get eaten by a lion, tiger, or bear. Oh no. You, you know, that's the end. Now you got to go start over. So you don't have to start over there. So it's a handy virtual reality to try things out in, to experiment with, because it's, it's a, a, a less restrictive rule set. So it's a less restrictive causality. It's another learning virtual reality. What happens when you die? That's a question I always get. Okay, so here we are. We think we're these bodies, and our brain is creating our consciousness. And when we die, well, there goes the consciousness with the body because the brain, you know, starts to rot and go away, and then we're just done. And is that really the way it is? Well, no, you're consciousness. You're not a body. If you're playing World of Warcraft and your elf dies, what do you do? Well, I think what you do in that game is you run back to the graveyard, you know, and uh, pick up your, your spirit there and then run back out on the battlefield and start, start swinging your sword again, okay? You don't die. You, the player, at the joystick, 
or the, the mouse and the keyboard, you don't die when your elf falls over in a battle. Right? You're fine, you're, you're consciousness. You just go on. Either you resurrect your character or you get another one, depending on the kind of game that you're, that you're playing. Well, why do you do that? Why do they make the games that way? Because it just wouldn't be much fun if every time you got into a tight situation in your virtual reality and your character died, that, you know, you have to go back and start over. You have to leave the game. All right, you're done. Go find another game. You know, you died here. So that wouldn't make any sense because you wouldn't learn anything. A lot of the game has to do with you playing enough that you figure out what's going on. You know, how do I play this game? What's the right strategy to win in this situation? What's, then I get a different situation. What's the strategy to win there? What do I need to do? You only gain that by experience. So you have to keep recycling your character again and again and again so you get enough experience that you can learn. That you can grow up some in that game. That your character now is wiser than it was before because you, the consciousness, are wiser because you played that game and lost. Well, now you start your character up again. Learning is cumulative. Okay. First we go to kindergarten, then we go to first grade, then we go to third grade. We don't just start in high school. You know, we have to build up through cumulative learning. Learning is a cumulative process. We have a lot to learn here. Growing up, becoming love isn't easy. Well, we can't do it in one shot. We need a cumulative process, and we need to accumulate what we learn here, the amount that we grow up, the amount of entropy we lose, that we get to keep. When we come back to do this again, we start from where we left off. We don't have the memory. That would not be helpful at all. The memory would just bog us down and get us in trouble. But we have what we've learned. We've got the quality of our consciousness is where we start and left off. So it's a cumulative process of learning. All learning has to be cumulative, you see? And if you have a long learning process, it takes a long learning sequence, like from daycare to graduate school. You know, it takes a long learning process. Well, we are more like in daycare. You know, this is not graduate school here. This is more like daycare. We tend to be full of fear. We tend to be full of ourselves. Most of our life is about us. We focus almost entirely on how to manipulate that upfront part to come out the way we want it. We're very self-focused, and that's just the way we are. And because we are that way, we create a reality that reflects us. We create systems and institutions that reflect us. When you look out at the world and say, wow, look at the world, look at the news and all the things that are going on in the world, that's awful. What an awful place this is. What you're looking at is an accurate representation of us, of we the people, of we the humans on the planet. We get basically what we are. So we look at our politics, we look at our leaders, we look at our institutions, we look at our corporations, we look at all of this, this stuff that we've built, it reflects us. Okay? I know that's a sobering, un unhappy thought, right? When you see that and say, well, that's, that's us, that's humanity. That's the way we are. That's the fear. That's the level of ego that we have. Okay, so that's, that's the way it is. But why are you here? Why am I here? It's because we want to do better. That's not good enough for us. We want to grow up. And the difference that it makes understanding what's going on is that if, if, you, are, if you don't understand the game and you don't know what you're doing, you're just wandering around clueless on the playing field, you're not going to do very well in the game. But if you understand it and you realize what's going on and what the point is, that you're here to become love. You're here to grow up. You're here to let go of your fear, let go of your ego. And you realize that's the game. Well, now you can start playing a game Effic efficiently, effectively. You can kind of go somewhere with it. And you realize that it's the fear, it's the ego that's causing you all the trouble. 
It's the ego and fear that makes you have to plan and control all that stuff because you're afraid that it won't be right and you won't have it the way you want it and this won't work and that person won't do that and you have to make sure that happens. It's all the fear and the stuff that you want because you know how it needs to be and you want it to be that way. You need to let go of all of that because that's what makes you miserable because when the more you try to control, the less it works out the way you want it. That's just part of the feedback. If you try, try really hard to control everything, it all goes to hell in a handbasket and you don't control hardly anything. You're miserable, you're unhappy because nothing works out right. Your spouse isn't right, you know, they're not, they don't understand you, you know, they're not doing things right. Your job isn't right, your boss doesn't understand you either, you know, your dog doesn't understand you, you know, you're, you're all alone and it's awful. And that's the way it is when you try to control everything. But it's amazing enough that when you give up the idea of control, when you say, okay, I'll just be. I'll just be now in the present. I'll deal with what I have to deal with it. I'll deal with it with grace and with caring and with love and compassion. And I'll just be. You find out that you don't have to control everything. That everything starts to fall in front of you just as you need it. If there's something you need that, that helps you grow and do something, it just appears. It's just there. I know it sounds like magic, right? This is like Cinderella story or something, but you know, a pumpkin suddenly becomes a carriage. But it'll work like that. It works like that. It's your own fear and ego that causes you the distress to live in a soap opera existence. And it's our mutual, you know, it's not just yours, but it's yours and, you know, everybody around you. We create this reality together. So that's, a, that's an important, uh, important concept. Okay, what time is it? Five. Where's Diana? Are we supposed to take a break at five? Not yet? Keep right on trucking? Okay, so when you are engaged in a experiential virtual reality, okay, then you have free will and you are a being. If you're not engaged in a virtual reality, what are you? You're just a potential. You're just a packet of potential. You've got a history, all the things you've ever done, thought, said, whatever, all your expectations, everything that's you is just there, but it's just information. You're just data, your history, your potential. And you just stay history and potential till you get into a virtual reality where now you can interact, you can express yourself, you see? So we're always in virtual realities. So back to what happens to us when we die. So here we are in this virtual reality. Consciousness just doesn't die. Your elf dies, but you don't. That's good, right? You wouldn't want to slump over on your keyboards, you know, and pass out and die because your elf did. So it's good. We just, consciousness keeps on going on. And what does it do next? Well, you find yourself in a, another virtual reality. Otherwise, you wouldn't find yourself at all. You'd just be a data packet, you know, sitting on a shelf with potential. But you find yourself in another virtual reality. That virtual reality that you find is one that is designed to help you make the transition from one virtual reality to another. Okay, so you're in this virtual reality and your body, your avatar croaks. It's run over by a truck or just gets too old. You, the consciousness then, wake up in a different reality frame. And because you have all these habits of thinking, you see yourself say, uh, you know, there's a, there's a light out there and you move toward the light, right? We have near-death experiences where people explain a little bit of what they experienced, you know, when they died for a little bit, for a minute or two before they were revived. Well, why do you move to the light? Because we can't imagine, we can't think in terms of going someplace without moving because we've got this concept of distance, you see, which is part of our virtual reality here. You don't have to move. It doesn't take any moving. When you're out in a larger conscious system, you don't have to fly around the remote view. It's all just intent. You are where you intend to be. 
So you end up in this larger, or in this other virtual reality, and in this other virtual reality, you are put to ease. You are content, you, someone will, might meet you there, you know, well, come with me, let's just go through the light and everything will be fine. Everything, it's all stuff to make you feel at ease, to relax, because you come there with fear. Where am I? You know, what's going on? And you're confused, you don't know, you're frightened. So you'll be met with somebody who's very pleasant, who's going to take care of you, going to lead you. You'll probably be met by relatives. Oh, there's Uncle Fred, you know, he died last year, 10 years ago or something. Hi, Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred smiles and said, oh, hi, welcome, you know, you'll have a good time. It's wonderful here. All of that is the larger consciousness system trying to put you at ease. You see, the larger consciousness system has no trouble at all playing Uncle Fred because everything that Uncle Fred ever thought was, any knowledge, anything he experienced, it's all in the historical database. Everything, clothes he wore, accent he had, every detail, every piece of knowledge, every piece of imagination is there. So you meet your relatives and then they say, well, you know, just go over there and it'll be fine. We need to go do something now. And you might think that's a little strange. They need, you know, it's only been 15 minutes and they have to go do something. But you go on over, you do what they say, and everything's okay. And most of the processing you'll have is just stuff, it's like busy work, made up to give you time to make the transition, for you to relax and let go. Because the, the virtual reality you were in here, in this physical universe, starts to fade just like a dream fades. So you wake up from a dream, and it's real clear, it's right there in front of you, but two or three minutes later, it's a little foggy, and an hour later, it's just splotchy, and eventually it's just kind of, you have a feeling of it, but it's kind of gone. Well, that's the way it works when you switch virtual realities. That's what happens when you switch from the dream virtual reality to this virtual reality. The dream virtual reality just fades out. When you go from this virtual reality to the dream virtual reality, your sense of being here just fades out very quickly, you see? So, your past life here will just begin to fade like a dream. And that's sometimes it's very upsetting to people because they say, no, you know, my loved ones, my children, my husband, my wife, my mother, my father, you know, I don't want them to fade out like a dream, but it happens anyway. Because that's just the nature of the way the reality works. You cannot cling to these forever. Think about it. Let's say you've had 10,000 lifetimes, which means you've had maybe 15,000 husbands and wives and 20,000 children and all of them were just dear to your heart. How could you deal with all of that if you hung on to it, if you kept it? You know, what would that be like? It would be madness, right? It would be so totally confusing. Not only that, you'd have the good times, but you'd have all the bad times, all the horrible, horrific things that had happened you know, would still be there. That wouldn't be nice. And what's worse, all your bad habits, all your old beliefs that caught you in belief traps, all the things you thought you knew but actually didn't, they just get in your way. It'd be a big problem. It would be such a cacophony of, of stuff that you just couldn't deal with it. You see, you have to let it go. Because your point here isn't to maintain that particular lifetime forever. It's to go on and learn and grow up. So you change situations. And those that are dear to us in the next life are also going to be dear to us. But we'll also let them go. Because, and a lot of people find that sad. It's just a real downer. They don't want it to be that way. But that's basically the way that it works. You go to a different virtual reality. You get relaxed. It lets go. They keep you busy standing in lines and busy work and, you know, classes and all kinds of little trivial things that really don't amount to anything because they're just biding time to let you let it all go. And after you let it all go, you're standing around, you're feeling kind of bored, like, well, what's next? You know, what am I supposed to do now? And somebody will come and say, well, you know, would you like to, you know, get back in the game? And you think about, well, Beach just standing around here not doing anything, sure. And then you say, well, what, what uh, would you like to do? Where would you like to go? You know, how would you like this lifetime? Now, this is somebody who has been around a bit. 
if you've evolved enough, you're at the point where you can make choices. You can plan. You may even plan to do this next lifetime with somebody that you know, somebody that you incarnate with a lot, you see, or maybe not. If you're just in the beginning of this game, where you've just gotten started, you haven't evolved a whole lot, well, it's more of a jump in, jump out. You don't have enough experience to really say what it is you need to do next. All you need is more experience. So you just jump back into the game wherever you, know, wherever you go. You get experience. You get enough experience, and pretty soon you say, well, you know, I, I did this part pretty well. I'm, I'm grown fairly well here, but my problem, my problem is, you know, I fly off the handle. You know, anger management. I get really upset easy and, and whatever. That's my issue. So I need something that'll help me with that. Or maybe you're not to the point that you're aware of that yet. And this, this guide that comes and talks to you, and, and they suggest, they say, you know, you've had a problem with anger management. Maybe we should give you a situation that'll kind of help you deal with that. And you say, anger management? Me? Not me. Man, I really dealt with some nasty people. You know, I, you know, I deserved to, you know, my anger was well deserved. They made me angry, you know, and uh, they'll say, well, you know, look at this, and you will get what they call like the life review. You will get to see in vivid technicolor, you at your worst, you know, where you didn't understand what was going on, but got mad just the same. And after a while, you will agree that you have this anger management problem, and maybe you need to do something about it. And you will agree, and you will end up then back in a virtual reality again to work on that particular problem. So it depends, everyone is at a different stage in their evolution. Some people it takes a longer process, some people it's short. Some people, like I say, jump in, jump out. There's hardly any process in the middle. Others plan out a process. Okay, but we don't generally plan, but so much because it's free will. Once you get down here and it starts, you may make different decisions than you thought you'd make or that you planned to make, and it kind of goes apart. And maybe you get nudged back into the plan. But that's kind of the, the nature. I guess that's what we're doing this afternoon. Okay, what's the nature of this larger reality and how we interact in it? So that's sort of the, that's sort of the process. Now let's say you're a very religious person your first question when you find yourself in another reality frame is, oh my God, I died. Second is, where am I now? Is this heaven or is this hell? You see, and you're scared to death about you know, what might come next and, and uh, so on. Well, somebody will greet you and help you get over that. And if your fear is only mediocre, then it may not take more than seeing a few relatives, a couple of things, and you kind of forget it and let it go. If your fear is really severe, then maybe you have to be met by some icon of your faith, you know, that will soothe you and make you feel okay. So then you may see whomever. The system will, will present itself as whomever it needs to, to help you make a successful transition. After all, the system wants you to succeed in your evolution. And if you're in some kind of a fear, you know, a tizzy, some kind of a fear thing, you're not growing. So it will try to help you as best it can. So I know I've disappointed a few people and you know, startled a few others, and some are saying, ah, that guy's really nuts. But that's sort of the way it works. And now, I guess a good question, if I were you and I were sitting in the audience, I'd raise my hand and I'd say, how, how the hell do you know that? You know, where'd you get all that from? Come on, that's not information you can read anywhere. Did you make all that up? Well, the, the way I get that information is the way I get most of my information. If you, can, if you can get outside of this virtual reality, you can be in other virtual realities. You can follow the process. You can be with a person who's dying, and as they die, you can go with them as they leave that body. You can. You know, if you like, be alongside of them. You can think their thoughts, you can share in their experiences. And on the other end, so you can, from this end, you can just experience it, and you can do that a hundred times. And there'll be variations, but again, because you're interpreting, right? So when you interpret, you realize you're adding things to it. But if you do it a whole lot of times, you'll find that there are, there are similarities, and the similarities 
begin to make sense and so on, and, and you begin to sift out what's, what you're making up and what you aren't. From the other end, if you're traveling around in the larger consciousness system, just kind of hanging out, you know, observing and looking around, somebody will come up and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you need a job? Just hanging around here, not doing anything? We want you to go work over here in, in the receiving line, you know, from the people who are just transitioning from a, from a body in that reality frame, and you can help us be part of the, you know, you're like the Walmart greeter, you know, you can be part of the, the, the greeting team. So I've done that. I've spent months working on that side, having different missions. They tell you here you have to work with this person and this person is having that problem, you know, try to deal with that and you get around. So I've worked both sides of that issue and it's different for everyone because everyone's different. But basically what I'm telling you is just kind of typical. It's the way it typically works for most of the people. You know, some of them are harder than others. Suicide victims are often a little harder to get them to let go because they're so intensely obsessed with their issue. Uh, some accident victims are like that too. They're so intensely focused on something important that they left behind maybe. Um, but eventually they all relax, they all let go, it fades like a dream, they go on. So that's the cycle. So here we are, like a you know, we're part of this process. I think of it, because I'm a technical guy, and those of you who are technical will like this, and those of you who are not will hate it. But I like to say it anyway, because I'm technical, so I like it. And that is, in a, the way a refrigeration cycle works is that you have a working fluid, like Freon, and you have a compressor. And when you compress a fluid, and you squeeze it, you get a high pressure, you squeeze it through a little hole, a little orifice. And as it squeezes through that little hole, it gets real hot on the high pressure side, and when it evaporates and sprays out, it gets real cold on the other side. Well, you hook a heater up to this side, and you hook a refrigerator up to the other side, and that's the refrigeration cycle. But that fluid just keeps getting pumped around and around and around. It gets compressed, it sprays out. It gets compressed, it sprays out. And that's the refrigeration cycle. Well, here we are, we are, individuated units of consciousness. Our job is to evolve consciousness. We do that by evolving our own, which evolves the whole thing. And we go around and around and around growing up because the growing process takes a long time. Now I've made it sound real cold and prickly, right? Oh, it's like a big machine. It's not at all. This is a machine that runs on love. This is a machine that runs on caring. It runs on trying to be helpful to you. It's really a very lovely, a very wonderful process. It's not a machine at all. It's a living thing. It's beings and very caring in the way that it works. And it gives you complete freedom, a free will to be however you are, to sink or swim, to grow up or grow down. So it's really very nice. And it's a, it's a you know, I kind of think of it as it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege. It's a real neat thing to be here and to have the opportunity to be in this place now, particularly in this time, a lot of things are going on now. To be a part of that. What you have to try to be, though, is to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Obviously, we've got problems here. You know, we're a very fear-based bunch of individuals. Are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? In as much as you make your choices based on fear and ego, you're part of the problem and you create unpleasantness and misery for yourself. In as much as you make love-based choices and are growing up, you're part of the solution. And you make choices that are helpful. You're happy, you're fulfilled, you're satisfied, life is good. So that's the nature of our system. It's really a very wonderful place and a, and a good opportunity. Now you want me to stop? You ready? Not yet. Oh, crack that whip, go on. Okay. So, um, so if we're not being played, if we're not, you know, we're not being played, you don't play your elf, what's your elf do? Just stands there, right? Doesn't do anything. He's immobile, he's not, he doesn't make any choices. 
He's not really alive. He's not animated anymore. Well, that's the way we would be if we're not played. We wouldn't be animated. But we're almost always played because we're almost always have opportunity to learn. So when we're played, that means when there's a consciousness that's, you know, making our choices and animating us, we're consciousness in this game, then we're learning. So that's the nature of the larger consciousness system. Okay. Let's talk a little bit next about using our minds to get around in this, in this uh, virtual, uh, virtual reality and outside of this virtual reality. How do we, and I guess I might as well start with a little bit of how do we, you know, how do you get there? What's the path? for experiencing this. See, I tell you, don't believe me, you have to go experience it. Well, experiencing it is not that hard, but it does take a will to do it. It's also not that easy in the sense that you have to want to do it and you have to make an effort. It's not a trivial thing to do. But the recipe isn't the new things you have to do, it's the old things you have to stop doing, see? It's not about, oh, there's this new, I need to, you know, I need to know, have this new techniques and this new whatever, and I have to do things differently. For one, it's not about doing. It has nothing to do with doing. It has to do with being. And secondly, you don't need anything new. You just need to let go of the stuff that's blocking it. You are consciousness. You don't have to become consciousness. You, re you already are. All you have to become is aware. Now, your first step in becoming aware is usually through meditation. That's the entry point for most of us. Not required. Meditation's just a tool. Not required. But it's the entry point for most of us. Why meditation? All you learn to do in meditation is to let go of the noise. Your mind right now is like this, you know, it's all over the place. You're thinking about what you're going to do when you leave here and, you know, what you did yesterday and, you know, what your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or your wife, or your husband are doing while you're not here and what are they doing and they get home safe and yada, 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 yada. It's going on all the time in your head and you jump around. You'll process a little bit of what I'm saying and then you'll run off and process something else and you'll process another little bit of what I'm saying. You'll run off and process something else. It's very hard for most of us to stay focused with our intent, absolutely focused on one thing for more than about five seconds, 10 seconds. That's about as long as we stay focused and then it's here and it's here and it's there and then it's back here. So we kind of are sampling. We're basically sampling all kinds of things all the time rather than focused. Well, we need to shut that down. We need to tell that, it's sometimes described as monkey mind. We need to tell that monkey mind to sit down and be quiet. That's our intellect, mostly, driving that. So that's the point of meditation. That's really the only point of meditation. If you want to get acquainted with consciousness, what better conscious to get acquainted with but your own? And you can't get acquainted with your own consciousness if your intellect is constantly flying around all over the place and you're doing this, you're doing that. All you need to do to be successful at meditating is just stop doing anything. Just let it go. Okay. Now, there's tricks called meditation techniques to help you do that. One of them is a, a mantra. That's a sound. You say a sound, and the point of that sound is it just occupies your mind so it stops flying around all over. It occupies the noise in your mind because you say focused on a sound. And it's a nonsense sound. It's not a sound that makes sense to you, otherwise you'd be operating on, you know, if the, if the, you know, if the sound was something you could, there was a noun in your language, you'd be stuck thinking about that. It's just a sound that has a, a kind of a resonant end. I can give you a sound that works fine. Um, you can make one up will work just as well. Mantras are not magic. They're just tools. Here's a sound you can use, Sering. Zaring, Zaring, you see? 
It's got an kind of vibratory sound at the end. You just say it in your mind. You don't have to say it out loud. You just say it in your mind slowly and keep that in your head. Now you can make up any sort of sound. Two syllables good doesn't have to be that way. It's just simpler. And it's good if it has kind of a resonant ing, bing, ling, ding, or bing a ling, whatever sound on the end of it. That kind of helps. All you're doing is filling up your mind full of this non-operative fluff so you keep the thoughts out. So you'll say that in your mind probably for about 30 seconds and pretty soon you're thinking about what you're gonna fix for supper tonight. And you say, oh, there's a thought, you know, go away. But gently go away. If you get upset, <clears throat> damn, another thought, you're even further away than you were before, you see. Now you have fear that you're not doing it right and your fear is becoming part of your process. So you just gently say, oh, a thought, go away, say your mantra, and you just keep doing that. And you'll find in the beginning, <laughs> you'll find in the beginning that it's difficult. You don't seem to go but seconds before thoughts come in. But then if you keep trying, those seconds become minutes. And those minutes become tens of minutes. And pretty soon you can sit and just say your mantra without any thoughts coming in. That's really good. That's a good place to be. The next thing you let go of when you don't have thoughts is you let go of the outside world. You stop really paying attention to what you're hearing. You close your eyes to what you're seeing. Now you'll still hear things. You're just no longer operating on them. What's that? Oh, that's the traffic. You're not operating, it's just there. You've let go of it. And then when you let go of all your sensory perceptions and you've let go of all your chatter, you are a point of consciousness floating in the void. Okay? That's your entry point. That's the doorway. From that doorway, you can accomplish anything else you want. You can go wherever you want to go. You can remote view, you can heal. You can do lots of things and be very effective once you get to that point. Now, it may take you a week to get there. It may take you two years to get there. Whatever it takes, you just need to be consistent and say, I'm going to do this. You can do it. It's not that hard. You just have to stay open-minded. You need to not judge the first time you get there and say, oh, is this it? Is this point consciousness? Did I do this right? Let me see. You know, can I hear anything? If you do all that analysis, you'll destroy the state. It'll be gone. Just open yourself, experience, let go. And that's the only recipe you need to be successful.